Cross it. Hey everybody, Dr. O here. Welcome to chapter 19. So we've got two chapters left. This one on uh, consumer concerns about foods and water, and then we'll look at global nutrition and hunger and malnutrition uh, to end out the course. All right, uh, so obviously we'll be talking about foodborne illness and water quality, lots of important things to unpack here. Uh, you know, where, where you live is going to play a big role in um, what, what types of concerns you should have. But I'm going to add a lot of things in here that I would cover primarily in microbiology about, about food safety. So I'll, I'll go into a little more uh, detail in, in a couple sections here in this chapter than, than, I, than I typically might. All right. Let's go ahead and dive in. So the icebreaker, when shopping, do you tend to gravitate towards fruits and vegetables that are organic, even if they look slightly less appealing, or those that have been treated with chemicals because they look better? Why would you choose one over the other? So you have this idea of like, you know, pretty pretty fruit and vegetables versus ugly fruit and vegetables. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of, you, this is obviously for you to think about, but a lot of people will choose the, the, the prettier stuff. But the reason that, you know, your apples might look prettier is because they've been covered in, in chemicals and waxes and different things. So uh, you have to decide if what's most important is how physically attractive um, your apple is or how nutritionally dense it is now. Uh, you know, and organic isn't magic, right? So or, organic, uh, if you buy organic, then you decrease uh, your exposure to pesticides. And, and I, you know, I personally think that that's not a bad idea because the link between pesticides and cancer and there, you know, there's a lot of interesting information there, but I don't know how big of a deal it is. Um, but, you know, personally, so, you know, as a gardener, I know that um, I don't really care how attractive the carrots and different things that come out of our garden are. I know because they were grown in healthy soil that they are nutrient dense. And that's the key, right? Something that's grown organic um, that isn't grown in healthy soil isn't going to be any more nutrient dense, right? Plants, some healthy plants produce more vitamins, but they need healthy soil uh, to, to become healthy plants. So I don't really think there's anything magic about it, but generally, personally, I am going to... Um, um, be considering organic more often than not. And I'll give you some more tips there too. But of course, then you've got the cost issue, right? So if, if you're on a budget, um, what do you choose to buy organic and what don't you? You know, it really depends. Uh, there, so one thing I'd recommend you look into, uh, a website um, from the Environmental Working Group called ewg.org. Um, has what's called uh, what do they call it? They have a uh, the dirty dozen. So every year they put out a list of the of the 12 things. If you, instead of buying all your produce organic, they have the dirty dozen, and I believe they have the clean 15. Uh, the number might change year to year, but the dirty dozen is if you if you don't buy, if you buy these 12 things organic. Um, you'll reduce your exposure to pesticides by 80% because some foods, uh, you know, like a coconut, you're not eating the outside of a coconut, you know, things like that. So where, where things are grown, how they're grown, whether or not you normally eat the outsides or not, all these things would impact how, mu how much pesticide you might be exposed to. So if, if you're not worried about it, I totally understand. You can, you can have a completely nutrient-dense diet and never buy anything that's organic. Uh, but we know that organics are becoming more and more common. Uh, I believe we're in the neighborhood of uh, 40, what is it, 40 billion uh, dollars a year is, is now being spent on organic stuff. And, and it's one of the most rapidly growing, if not the most rapidly growing uh, part of our food budget. Doesn't mean that organics are, are super common yet, but the, the, the increase is there. Uh, so that there's an idea where maybe you can kind of split the difference and, and you decide to go, I buy these 12 things organic, and but the things that are on the clean 15 list or on neither list, then I, then I don't buy organic. And uh, though there's lots of reasons to choose uh, what, what you buy. Uh, if you buy things because of taste or cost, those are all acceptable things. But if you're looking to minimize pesticide exposure, um, then organic may be the way to go. But from a nutrient density standpoint, I really can't promise you that, uh, that, that they're more nutritious. Uh, I, you know, that's why I feel really good about having a garden because I know that the soil in my backyard and we, and we amend it and we add, we add things to it. And so I know the soil we're using hasn't been used for generations and generations like the cropland you see around here. So chances are there are more, there are more nutrients in the soil and we have our soil tested. Your state extension offices will, um, um, will test your soil for, for a real small fee. So we know that the, the soil we're using is good. And, and, and that's, to me, that's another vote for, um, for gardening on top of whether you choose organic or not at the store. Store. But yeah, check out that Dirty Dozen list. It's pretty cool. Okay, your learning objectives for this chapter. Descri describe how foodborne illnesses can be prevented. We'll talk a lot about um, minimizing contamination and controlling temperatures. Explain how to minimize nutrient losses in the kitchen. Explain how environmental contaminants get into foods and how people can protect themselves against contamination. We talked about that quite a bit when we covered the, the, the minerals uh, early because many of the contaminants we're exposed to can be minerals, but there are tons of other... Uh, pesticide byproducts and those kind of things that we have to confront. 
identify natural toxicants and determine whether they are, are hazardous. Um, uh, debate. I was just gonna say, like, there's, you know, like, this is why we, we were talking yesterday at the house here about how why you're supposed to cook your potatoes. If you if you don't cook your potatoes, there are there are some compounds there that that need to be neutralized, like the lectins that are in potatoes and and, and solanine and different things. So uh, you now you need to probably eat 20 pounds of raw potatoes to get sick, but still, those are examples of maybe natural toxicants. Uh, debate the risks and benefits of using pesticides uh, because there are benefits. You know, people talk about the risks and and, pe and, and the negatives of pesticide exposure, but um, you know they also improve yields and keep costs down, etc. List common food additives, their purposes and examples, and discuss consumer concerns about water. So we have a lot to cover here. So let's dive in. Nutrition and infectious diseases. So the Food and Drug Administration they focus on potential hazards of food. Uh, think about you know things like. Um, um, contamination, uh, unsafe packaging, etc. Uh, this differs from toxicity and, it, and, they, and they set the standards to protect consumers. So it's just a, we'll, we'll be looking at things like, uh, uh, you know, a food additive. How, how quote unquote dangerous can a food additive be, but it's still classified as safe? Well, we'll look at those things like generally recognized as safe. Um, the CDC estimates 48 million cases of foodborne illness each year in the United States. I don't even know. I don't even know. Like that number's fair, but sometimes you see estimates that are closer to 75 million, and then other other estimates are much higher. And the big issue here is that um, <clears throat> think about how many times you've had food poisoning, but you never went to the doctor, you never went to the hospital, so you were never on any list, right? So they're they're trying to estimate how many people get sick when the huge majority of people that get food poisoning are never diagnosed or, and never treated. So uh, uh, you have some loose stools, you have maybe some vomiting and diarrhea for a day, you, you move on. So I think this number could be much much higher, but that's the number you should know that the CDC. C estimates 48 million cases of foodborne illness each year. That's in the U.S. alone. Estimated 128,000 may need hospitalization, and estimated 3,000 die each year. And in, you know, in the past, foodborne illness would have been much more fatal, and it still is in many parts of the world. The main issue that so few die now is because we can control the symptoms. Right? My sister had salmonellosis one time, and she had extreme amounts of vomiting, uh, vomiting and diarrhea. Uh, but they gave her medication to slow her bowels down. They gave her liters of fluid. These are the kind of these these are the reasons she survived. The salmonellosis wasn't any less dangerous than it would have been in the past. But they could they could help her through the process by keeping her hydrated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So who's at the highest risk? Uh, very young, pregnant women, the very old, sick, malnourished, and those with a weakened immune system are most vulnerable. And all the people on that list have a weakened immune system. So the you know the young, youngest young, uh, you know when you're really young, your immune system isn't developed yet. When you're really old, your immune system doesn't work very well. I mean, aging is really an immunosuppressive disorder. When you're pregnant, your immune system is suppressed, and that's because um, you have a foreign invader living inside of you, and you know it's it's half you, half someone else. So you, the immune system it has to be suppressed to some extent during pregnancy. Pregnancy. And then if you're already sick with other underlying uh, conditions, uh, you're, you're, you're malnourished, you're, you're starving, those are all things that would impact the immune system as well. So really, when you get foodborne illness, the strength of your immune system is generally what determines if you live or die, just like with other infectious diseases. Uh, another interesting example, though, I mentioned salmonella earlier. Um, you know, some studies have shown that um, another really important deal is when was the last time you had an antibiotics? So if a, if a room full of people all got, got all got a salmonella infection, the people that had had the antibiotics the most recently were at the highest risk of dying, and that's because the your microbiome, right, the, the microbes inside your gut, one of their jobs is to is to control the population of invaders and to or to keep them out. So if you've recent, recently taken antibiotics, then you've wiped out this, this, these good bacteria, so there's more room for the bad ones like salmonella to take hold. So another interesting thing to consider there. Okay, um, a, few, a few more like stats. So I, I wrote down a couple here. The uh, salmonella is the one that leads to the most hospitalizations. I men mentioned that. Uh, the most common food toxin, so the most common... Uh, Food toxin is from staph, so Staphylococcus aureus, which uh, which can can release a toxin called the Staphylococcal enterotoxin, and that infects up to a million um, up to a million people a year. So, all right. There's a few other things to know there. So food safety in the marketplace. So how, what, you know, it's the tra transmission of foodborne illness is the key. So changes in the transmission of foodborne illness, errors in the commercial setting affect many more people than in the past. So it used to be you prepared almost all your food at home. So if you, you know, you, if your food was already contaminated, then that's how you got sick or if you contaminated it. But now you got to think of the, you know, the, all the other people that are coming into contact with your food and potentially transmitting disease. 
So mistakes with contamination. So a, a sick person working in a kitchen, you know, whether that's in a kitchen in a hospital or at a restaurant where you're at, um, that person transmitting the disease to you is really the, the most common place we see mistakes now. So, so the, be the best ways to prevent errors in, in the commercial setting are to make sure that people know how to properly handle their food. They're, you know, they're uh, washing their hands. They're, they're, they're preventing cross-contamination as much as possible. Yeah, it used to be uh, the leading cause of foodborne illness was in the home, but now we eat out so much more that the, the leading cause is these mistakes that are made in the commercial setting. So industry controls, uh, so you got to realize that food safety is is being dealt with at every step uh, in, the, in, in the process from the farm all the way to your fork. Hazard analysis critical control points or HACCP system. And this is good. This is trying to monitor these types of things, and it monitors imported foods as well. Um, consumer awareness. You have state and local health regulations. You know, a lot, a lot of places like not where I live, but a lot of places they they actually give restaurants grades, and or or you can look up online and see um, how how risky it is to eat at a certain place. Guidelines are for cleanliness and safe preparation of food. Uh, Sell-by dates, use-by dates, best before dates, expire on dates. These are all things designed to protect you. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say that I've never, eat, I, I haven't eaten anything once it's reached that best before date. But uh, you know, when they say that to use it or freeze it by a certain time, uh, there's some wiggle room in there. But yeah, you're, you're better off following those guidelines to the T. All right, improper food handling can occur anywhere on the line from the manufacturer to the consumer. So like I said before, from the farm to the fork, and you see that here. So, so the, how do we keep our food safe? We have a massive food system now, right? It used to be that, you know, your, your grandparents or great grandparents, they um, grew most of their own food and, you know, they tried to, they, they sustained themselves um, on their own farm, these types of things. Just not the case anymore. So you've got, you've got our food has become this massive industrial co agricultural complex and um, food safety, it doesn't just matter what you do. What you do is very important and the, and the thing you can control the most, but uh, it's very important that your food was safe when it got to you as well. So at the farm, workers must use safe methods of growing, harvesting, sorting, packing, and storing food to minimize contamination hazards. Notice minimize, not eliminate. This is still a very common source of contamination. Um, flooding and runoff and these types of things can lead to your produce being being um, you know covered with fecal material, for example. So fecal material is still the real, really uh, leading cause of a foodborne illness. But um, but the problem is, and you notice that a lot of your food recalls <clears throat> are greens, right? There's, I mean, it's got its cantaloupe, it's tomatoes, it's peanuts, it's, it's, uh, uh, I mean, there's so many of them. Uh, they're, they're spinach, different types of lettuce. You constantly are hearing about these food recalls, and many of them are, are produce. And the reason for that is because they've been contaminated, usually with fecal material, but you don't cook them, right? So, you, you know, if you have contaminated meat, you cook it to the appropriate temperature, it greatly reduces the risk. The food you don't cook is the food you have to be um, the most, most careful with. All right, uh, then, you, then processing. Processors must follow FDA guidelines concerning contamination, cleanliness, and education and training of workers, and must monitor for safety at critical control points, so the places where contamination is most likely to happen. Now here, it could be it could be contamination with foodborne illnesses from bacteria, et cetera, but it also can be things like metal shavings. You, you see a decent number of, of food recalls come from those types of things. Something went wrong with a machine, or, or like, I, like I mentioned, metal shavings working their way into meat and those types of things. Uh, transportation. Containers and vehicles transporting food must be clean. Cold food must be kept cold at all times. So it doesn't matter how good of a job you do refrigerating your food if it wasn't if it, if the cold chain wasn't maintained and it wasn't kept cold uh, on the way to you as well. Uh, this is really important in the dairy industry. You got these huge tankers carrying milk that either is going to be bottled or or turned into cheese or yogurt. Um, those tanks have to be um, kept very very clean because any contamination there uh, would lead to serious issues. Issues. And a lot of times that, that contamination happens, let's say with milk, after it's been pasteurized. So you properly pasteurize dairy to reduce infectious disease risk, but then you, you transport it in a container where it gets contaminated, that can be a serious problem. And that's why, you know, we consume raw dairy, I've mentioned it before, but uh, which there is an increase in infectious disease risk when you do that. But um, there are still you know, more cases of people getting uh, infectious diseases or foodborne illness from pasteurized dairy in the United States than, than raw dairy. Now, because, and usually it has to do with um, issues with transportation. Now, that's unfair to say that because only around 7% of Americans ever consume any raw dairy. So even if the numbers are higher, remember that a huge majority of people are using pasteurized dairy. So I will, I will gladly admit that pasteurized dairy carries less infectious disease risk than, than raw. All right, uh, retail. 
Employees in grocery stores and restaurants must follow the FDA's food code on how to prevent foodborne illnesses. Establishments must pass local health inspections and train staff in sanitation. So these are all, all really important things, uh, whether it's the grocery store keeping your food at the appropriate temperature and not, or not contaminating it, or it's the people preparing your food in a restaurant, etc. All right, and then at the table, I, I always like to say farm to fork because it sounds better, but at the table, consumers must learn and use sound principles of food safety as taught in this chapter. Be mindful that foodborne illness is a real possibility and take steps to prevent it. So what you know, what, what you do with the food before it reaches your table and then when it reaches your table, all important. You know, washing your hands, using clean dishes, all things we'll cover. Okay, um, so food safety in the kitchen where you really, you know, you can really start to take care of your food. And thankfully there are methods that even if your food has, has been contaminated, hopefully you can uh, minimize the risk or eliminate the risk by, by proper food safety in your own kitchen. Control what you can control, as they say. All right, so clean. Wash hands and surfaces, countertops, cutting boards, sponges, and utensils before and after each step of food preparation. It's like in the lab, right? I, I, I teach in a microbiology lab, and we, we clean and disinfect before we do anything, after we do anything, and then any time there are spills. So it's, I, treat, I treat my kitchen the same way that I would treat um, our lab. Uh, you know, I like to use th I like to use products that have hydrogen peroxide in them, but there's plenty of plenty of good cleaning products. But yeah, but cl cleaning things before you get started, before you get any of your food out, is a really good idea. And then cleaning afterwards is really important too. Uh, think about um, you know you've got chicken here. You're going to be working with raw chicken. Uh, you, you know, cleaning your surfaces before is really important, but cleaning them after is especially important because you don't want to be leaving uh, Campylobacter or Salmonella around your in your your home uh, one quick thing to mention there when we talk about washing and rinsing and cleaning things um, do you, you you are not supposed to rinse chicken right lots and lots of people do that they buy the chicken they take it out of the package they rinse it in the sink and then they then they bread it or fry it whatever they're gonna do to it uh, don't do that because that actually st multiple studies have shown that that rinsing your chicken spreads those organisms onto your sink and and your uh, your faucet and the and the table backsplash all these areas leave those microbes leave the microbes from your chicken and your fish and these kind of things leave them on the meat because you're going to cook the meat and that will kill those microbes don't splatter them onto your sponge or splatter them onto the surface where you can where you can be contaminated so that's a little little helpful tip for you so clean them we said separate keep raw eggs meat poultry and seafood separate from other foods reason being you're going to cook these things so if these things are contaminated, it's okay as long as you, I'm not saying to risk it, but it, it's mo more okay because you're gonna if you cook them to the appropriate temperature, you will have killed those microbes. If these foods come into contact with the foods you're not gonna cook, like your salad, that's when you get into deep, deep trouble. So keep keep raw eggs, meat, poultry, and seafood, the things that carry most of the contamination, keep them away from other foods, and that's because of the idea of cross contamination, chicken guts going down your drain, chicken guts being on a chicken that's being cooked to the appropriate temperature, they're okay. Chicken guts on your counter where you're going to touch them, touch the counter and then touch your face, or chicken guts on your salad that isn't being cooked, that's a whole different story. So preventing cross-contamination is important. So how do we do that? I use separate parts of the kitchen. We use separate cutting boards. So we have a cutting board for these foods that we that we that we clean up real good and then we have we have a cutting board for things that aren't going to be cooked so our, our salads or chopping up fruit those those kind of things are going to occur on a different cutting board in a different part of the kitchen than where we're preparing the chicken or fish those types of things um, also preventing cross-contamination uh, uh, you can wear gloves my wife likes to use gloves she, she hates uh, raw meat so um, when she'll she'll put on gloves to prevent c contamination if she's working with chicken or raw beef raw beef um, what else paper towels right I'm all for the environment but I'm a big fan of paper towels in the kitchen Th reusable things like sponges like towels they can be contaminated very very easily so if you want to use them be very careful that you're not contaminating them I saw a study once where they were um, they put video cameras in people's kitchens and didn't tell them what they were looking for or else they lied to them but they weren't they didn't tell them what they actually were doing was looking for mistakes in the kitchen and they found like just videos of people like maybe wiping up chicken guts with a towel and then using the same towel on their kids face a few minutes later that's a really bad idea so we don't, you know, we have towels for drying things once we've cleaned them and for drying off surfaces and those kind of things, but it's all about paper towels in our kitchen. So you, you dispose of the paper towels so they can't become a source of cross-contamination. So another tip for you. All right, cook food at the proper temperatures. We'll talk about the danger zone and temperature, but it's very important to keep food um, below this danger zone temperature range before you prepare it. Uh, get it get it above the danger zone and cook it to the proper temperature and then get it back cooled again as quickly as you can, which is the last point. Refrigerate promptly. So we'll look there. I have a picture coming up at the danger zone and I'll give you some more information there. 
All right, so go ahead and pause and try to answer these questions to match these. All right, proper internal temperature to kill microbes, use cooking your food. Soap and warm water is used to clean. You don't cook with soap. Uh, place in the refrigerator or freezy, freezer promptly, that's chill. Raw eggs, meat, poultry from other food, you separate, keep them separate from the um, greens, etc. Washing hands and surfaces is clean and cross-contamination is keeping things separate. All right, so here we see the danger zone. So safe handling of meat and poultry. So these, uh, uh, you see here that uh, between, you know, between 40 and 140 degrees is called the danger zone. Do not keep foods between 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 140 degrees Fahrenheit for more than two hours or for more than one hour when the air temperature is greater than 90 degrees. So like if you're outside at a family reunion or something like that. So two hours in your refrigerator, one hour if the air temperature is really warm. So why? This danger zone is where, where the microbes that cause foodborne illness, it's where they grow the best and where some of them produce toxins. So let me give you an example of why the toxins are so important. Let's say that you, you, you made a casserole and took it to a family reunion. So when you cooked it, you cooked it to the appropriate temperature. You see, so like, let's say stuffing. So you see stuffing there, 165 degrees. So you, you cooked this food, the stuffing to 165 degrees because you know there were some concerns. And then you took it to this family reunion and it sits outside for four hours, right? I've, I've had plenty of family reunions. I've seen the food sitting around. It sits outside for four hours. So during that time, it's in the danger zone where microbes are growing and toxins are being produced. So the next day, then you take it home for leftovers. The next day, um, you say, okay, I mean, this sat out for a while. It's probably still good, but I better make sure I cook it appropriately. So you see reheated leftovers, also 165 degrees. So you cook it using a meat thermometer or whatever. You, you cook it, you know that it's reached 165 and you eat it and you get sick. And that's because both times you cooked it, you cooked it to the appropriate temperature. So you did kill the bacteria. But the problem is while that food was sitting in the danger zone, uh, toxins are being produced and 165 degrees, not hot enough to kill those, to destroy, not kill them in their life, to destroy those toxins. So basically you could be one of those million people a year, sorry, my contact's coming out, that gets, um, that gets exposed to staphylococcal and teratoxin and, um, and you get sick. So uh, that, that's, that's why it's super important to, to keep food out of the danger zone because even if you do the right thing, so both, those, both days you cooked the food correctly, but it was mishandled uh, and left sitting out too long and that's when it became dangerous. All right, uh, so, so keeping food uh, cold, so you, um, you see there refrigeration temperature starts at 40 degrees and drops zero degrees freezer temperatures. So you freeze your food and then thawing it. The key with thawing it is to make sure that food doesn't get in the danger zone while it's being thawed. So by far the safest way to thaw things that were, that were frozen is in the refrigerator. Because that way it goes from freezer temperature, but it stays down here in the refrigerator temperature the whole time it's thawing. So that, that takes a long time though. So if you're in a hurry, some people will do, um, you know, thawing, leaving things sitting out. But the, see the problem with that is part of, you know, you, you leave food sitting out at room temperature, Part of the food is already thawed and in the danger zone while other parts are frozen. Same thing with, I remember the big old turkeys getting thrown in the kitchen sink. Um, so you put them in water. Well, that's okay if the water's cold and you constantly change the water. Because if you let it sit there all day where you're at work, the water warms up. You've got part of that turkey is still frozen, but other parts are in the danger zone. So that's why thawing in the refrigerator is the safest method. Uh, as far as a microwave, for thawing goes there's kind of some debate about this but um, the issue with microwaves is that they heat so unevenly so microwave radiation is used to excite water molecules and basically the food warms itself as the water gets excited and gives off heat but it heats really unevenly so if you, if you thaw or cook food in the microwave um, you will probably have some areas in the danger zone while other areas are not whether it's when you're thawing maybe most of it is still cold but there are pockets that have gotten too warm or when you're cooking it, most of it reaches the appropriate temperature, but there are pockets that didn't. You all, we all know this, right? You, you put a hot pocket in the microwave and you eat and you take one bite and it's got an ice chunk in it. And the next bite is like, take, feels like the surface of the sun. It's so hot. So my, the, the weakness with microwaves is how they heat unevenly. I would say if you're going to use the microwave for thawing, um, it's safest if you do it right before you use it and you immediately get it cooking. But um, you decide there. So just notice that this idea of the danger zone is to keep food below the danger zone before you cook it. Cook it to the appropriate temperature. So you see like well done meats, 170 degrees. I don't do well done meats, but uh, 165 for poultry, casseroles and leftovers, 160 for ground meats, and then whole cuts of meat is 145. So why are why is ground beef 
a higher temperature than a steak, which is basically the same thing, right? Ground chuck, a, ch a chuck roast or chuck, chuck eye steak can be ground up into ground beef. That's because when you have a whole piece of meat, like a steak, um, as long as the outside gets hot enough, you kill off all the microbes because that's where they are. They're on the outside of the flesh. Ground beef, the outside becomes the inside. So you have to cook ground meat much more thoroughly. And that's why a steak is safe at 145 degrees, but ground beef isn't safe till you get to 160. All right, um, then you keep hot foods, keep it above, uh, keep it at 140 or above, like maybe you're sitting at a buffet or something. The food has to stay above there, and, it, and, it's, and even then it still shouldn't be out for more than a couple hours. That number has kind of dropped. When I first started teaching, it was stuff was safe for four hours. Now it's down to two or less. But, and then, but then the key is to, so we talked about the last point said to, wait, where did it say that? To refrigerate it, right? Get it, get it refrigerated quickly. Oh, that was a couple slides ago. But, so you cooked it to the appropriate temperature. You ate it. Now you've got to get it down through the danger zone to the safe refrigerator temperature. So the, the key things here are, number one, um, you know, let, let it sit for a little bit. You don't want to put things in the refrigerator when they're too hot. And that's because they will warm up the refrigerator, right? You put, a, you put a big container of something that's piping hot, it will actually warm up the food around it and could potentially cause problems. So let, it, let the temperature come down a bit. You can keep it out for two hours. I don't, I don't know about you, but we don't eat supper for two hours. So we... We prepare our food, prepare our plates, we eat our supper. By the time we're done eating our supper, we, we will divvy up the leftovers and by then they should be cool enough to put away. If not, wait a few extra minutes. So yeah, and then the other thing is to use small containers. So if you, uh, we used to, when I was a kid, I remember we had big, we used big containers for leftovers and it's not a good idea. My parents did these things called smokers at the Legion where they would have oyster stew and chili feeds and these kind of things. And they'd bring, I remember they'd go on a Saturday, Saturday night, Sunday morning I'd wake up and go to the refrigerator. There'd be a gallon ice cream container of chili, let's say, and it was still warm, right? It had been in there for hours and it was still warm. So the container size matters a tremendous amount. So you take them. So what we do with our leftovers is we put them into single serve containers, right? That way you put six small containers in, in your refrigerator instead of one big one. Uh, and not only it, will it cool faster and be safer, but it's already ready. You know, you know, on the week weekends we make a lot of food and we repair them and put them in containers. You grab the container and you go to work, right? So I think it's a win-win. So divvy up your leftovers uh, before you put them away. Small containers do matter. Like one study um, found they were looking at a specific organism called Bacillus subtilis, but they looked at a two-inch versus a four-inch container of rice. So with a two-inch container of rice, within a couple of hours, that temperature in the refrigerator, that, temp that, that, that rice temperature had dropped below the danger zone. A four-inch container, eight hours later, was still in the danger zone. So we were talking about huge differences. So use, use, use thermometers, cook your food at the appropriate temperature, thaw it correctly, cook it correctly, don't leave it out too long, and get it cooled as rapidly as possible on the way back down. That's how you keep your food safe. And then we talked about all the ways to prevent cross-contamination as well. All right, safe handling of seafood. Illnesses associated with undercooked or raw seafood, things like listeria. Uh, there can be parasitic infections from seafood as well. Uh, raw, raw oysters can lead to leads a lot, lots, lots of issues there. Again, I'm not saying I mean, I've had plenty of raw oysters and nothing went wrong, but um, you know the, you're, you're talking all about probabilities, right? So a raw raw oyster is going to be uh, more likely to cause um, food burn illness than than a cooked one. Water pollution can lead to serious issues. So if, if like if if your seafood's been living in an area where you have um, the red tides, for example, then they can they can pass those toxins on to you. Um, other precautions has odors. So yeah, you should not be eating um, seafood that stinks. You might think seafood all stinks, but um, you know what I mean. That stinks like it's gone bad or turned. That, that'd be the case with anything really. All right, food safety while traveling. So you've heard this idea of traveler's diarrhea. Um, you have, you know, some studies show almost a 50% chance of, of having traveler's di diarrhea depending on where you go and how long you're gone. But um, so traveling to other countries, a risk of contracting food illness is high. And that's because, um, you know, not only do they not have, like you see, are different cleanliness standards for food and water. So the, the food and water may not be as clean to begin with, but it's also contaminated with different microbes than you're used to. Right? It's kind of like when I was a kid, we had well water. And if someone would come to our home and consume a bunch of well water they weren't used to, uh, they might they might not feel good just because there there sometimes can be some contamination there. But we were used to that. Uh, just like you know, my stepson goes to India and they, there's a lot of diarrhea there. But um, but the people that he's with are so used to what they're exposed to on a daily basis that um, you know if it was going to make them ill, it already did or it already would have. So he had to take precautions that people that live there don't. So you just you it's almost like whatever biological region you're in, your body kind of gets used to that. And if you stray outside of that, you're way more likely to get sick. 
All right, every region's microbes are different, so I just mentioned that. Uh, no chance to develop immunity. So, so if you drink the water, if you go like, you know, my, my stepdaughter went to Costa Rica for her honeymoon. If they drank the water in Costa Rica, it's the first time they were exposed to that, which means there were probably microbes there their immune system hadn't seen, and that would cause some traveler's diarrhea. People living there had been exposed to it so so much that they they had le a develop a, a level of immunity that my stepdaughter and her husband couldn't have. Uh, precautions while traveling, boil it, cook it, peel it, or forget it. Um, and that's very true. You know, drink drink bottled water or boil the water. Things should be cooked. The, pro the hard part is like you want to try all the food from the area. But if you're dealing with, you know, raw seafood or um, fruits and vegetables, um, you've got it. You've got to take extra precautions because like, like I said, they're peeling them, peeling things, cooking things. Uh, a big one to remember is ice. Like people will know, oh, if I go to go to Mexico, I don't drink the water. But that you know, don't use ice cubes, which is frozen water, right? So that you know, put some ice in your beer, these types of things. So you are generally better off um, you taking these precautions. Uh, bot bottled water, bottles of drinks, those kind of things. Boil it, cook it, peel it, or forget it. I like that. All right, advances in food safety. So what are some of the ways that we keep our food safer now than ever before? Uh, things like irradiation. So you, you know, they, um, unless you always buy organic spices, for example, your spices have been irradiated, right? So, so you see there, so irradiation sterilizes some foods, controls insects, extends shelf life, and delays ripening of some fruit. Irradiation is used in the European Union a lot more in the United States, and um, you know, they, they, everything seems to be good there. So that's one example. Also, your packaging can be radiated or sterilized. Uh, they can use like hydrogen peroxide steams or radiation. So the packaging your food goes into has probably been sterilized as well. So which to reduce contamination. Ultra high temperature treatments. So things like, um, you know, it used to be um, pasteurization was like a stovetop pasteurization that took 30 minutes. Now, you, now there's ultra high temperature, ultra low time um, a pasteurization. So now you can get things that have been ultra pasteurized. So that's that's a good thing. Um, you can they, there you can use pressure. There's all sorts of control methods that can be used nowadays. Um, approved for use by numerous health agencies worldwide. So it, overall, it is considered that things like irradiation and and ultra high temperature uh, that they they have been deemed safe. Consume consumers do have concern about radiation though. So this is uh, and that's totally fine. And one of the reasons to buy organic because things that are organic can't be irradiated. So that's that's up to you. Um, if you see what's called the radura, it looks like a green flower. Uh, that can be a symbol on a label that something's been irradiated. And you often will hear uh, the term electronic pasteurization. So if you see those things, that you it means that your food's been the the food's been irradiated. So yeah, I, I personally I think that the uh, the if there is any risk, uh, it's the 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 reward of decreasing um, foodborne illnesses is, is greater. But uh, not saying I go out of my way to look for things that are irradiated, but but so far it seems like it's okay. All right, um, so those are some things you can do. I mentioned you can use really high pressure as well. There's lots there's lots of ways to um, ultra high pe pressure. That's called pascalization after Pascal rather than pasteurization. Um, I've seen that used like with your pre cooked meat. You know, you can go to the store and you can buy uh, the chunks of chicken that have already been cooked that you just toss on a salad. Sometimes those they, they use high pressure for those. Sometimes uh, juices as well. I think like fruit juices would be an example of where you might see that happen. So lots and lots of ways. We have, we have ways to keep our food safe that our ancestors uh, certainly never did. Prior to refrigeration, fermentation was basically the only food preservation method that we had. All right, nutritional adequacy of foods and diets, nutrient information and losses. So we're talking about like the losses of nutrients. So this is kind of a new term, right? We talk about whole foods versus processed foods, but now we have this idea of ultra processed foods. So it appeals to consumer demands for convenience and flavor. So when you when you process foods, um, you do extend their shelf life. A lot of times they're already prepared, right? If you if you buy food that's in a box or a bag and you throw it in the microwave and it's ready in a couple minutes, that food's been processed. Really, I like the term ultra processed because cooking meat is processing it, right? Turning cabbage into sauerkraut is processing it. Basically, all food has been processed to some extent. Alter processed is when it's been basically manufactured, right? So they usually, they taste pretty good, um, relatively inexpensive, um, easy to make. Like you see there, cost, convenience, flavor. They have long shelf lives. That's the, the plus side. Um, the downside though is that they usually they lose a lot of nutrition, right? I've, I've shown you this in e earlier chapters, how um, processed foods generally have way less potassium and way less magnesium and way more sodium, for example, than, than, than their whole food counterparts. And then you've got food additives, which we'll cover as well. So nutrition labeling, you see the the FDA is require uh, the FDA is responsible for most food labels. The USDA they're responsible for labeling when it comes to things like meats. Uh, my plate, we've talked about that. The, that that comes from the Dietary Guidelines for America. 
or Americans. Um, so learning to store and cook, this would be, again, if, if you're going to rely on more whole foods, then um, they, they, that they can't just be stored easily. And the lights just flipped off, I think. Uh, maybe, or else I, did I blink along? I don't know what's happened there, sorry. Uh, but um, if, if, you're, if you're consuming whole foods, then yeah, you have to do, you know, we do a lot of food prep on the weekends and things like that. You've got to learn how to cook your food and store your food, uh, but generally it is more nutrient dense. All right, uh, pause this and see if you can answer these questions. Advances in food production mean many foods are ultra-processed, appealing to consumers' demands for convenience and flavor. The FDA develops nutrition labeling regulations. The USDA helps consumers with healthy eating patterns. My plate helps put the guidelines into practice. All right. Um, learning how to store and cook vegetables helps reduce nutrient losses. So that, you know, there's, we can talk about that some more. But uh, um, basically, the longer produce has been stored, the more nutrients it's going to lose. Especially, especially like vitamins and minerals and stuff, vitamins especially. Um, so, you know, having your own garden is great because then you can you can cut, the, we, we literally cut lettuce off the plant and eat it immediately. So uh, there's no nutrient losses there. So the longer that produce has been off the vine or whatever, if it's been, you know, if it's traveled 3,000 3, miles to get to you and it's been on boats and trucks and set in the store for a week, then it's going to be some nutrient losses. So uh, uh, the fresher, the better. And then with cooking methods, you know, some methods are, uh, you know, light, lightly sauteing something will we'll we'll leave more nutrients than uh, other cooking methods, for example. Uh, the nutrient content in frozen vegetables is similar compared to fresh. I actually kind of like that. So, the, so we always think of fresh as best, but if food's going to be sitting around for a long time, when you freeze it, there are some nutrient losses that come with the freezing process, but then it stabilizes. Whereas, so if you, you're like, hey, if I should I buy fresh broccoli and let it sit for a week and eat it, or should I buy frozen broccoli and let it sit in the freezer for a week and eat it? You can make an argument that after that week, um, the frozen broccoli is better. So uh, I'm I'm not a snob when it comes to produce. I think frozen vegetables they're they're priced good and um, they usually have a lot of nutritional value as well. Nothing wrong with fresh. I I'm a, I love the garden in the farmer's market and going to the store for fresh produce, but uh, um, I don't demonize frozen vegetables at all. Now, canned vegetables, I would say frozen is always better than canned and, and fresh is probably always better than canned. There are some nutrient losses, but then you've just got the, you've got the high sodium content, etc. And then cans, if you're looking at exposure, like we're talking about in this chapter, uh, most cans are lined. They have uh, plastic liners inside of them that are lined with BPA, which is, which is a compound that people probably don't want exposed uh, any, to be exposed to more than they need to. Microwaving and steaming causes decreased nutrient losses compared with boiling or pressure cooking. So completely agree with that. Uh, steaming is really nice too. Like I like to steam vegetables and then I will use the water that I use to steam the vegetables. You can pour that into soups and stews or you can just drink it because that would, whatever nutrients were leached into the water, um, you can get by drinking that water. So I'm, I can be weird sometimes, but I absolutely will, um, will drink the water. Once it's cooled down, of course, I'll drink the water or throw it in a soup or stew that I've used to steam vegetables. And microwaving is a, is a pretty good way uh, to, to maintain most nutritional value of your produce. All right, environmental contaminants. The harmfulness of environmental contaminants. Harmfulness of environmental contaminants depends in part on its persistence, things that linger in the body. So are things biodegradable or not, right? So how, what is the half-life of a compound, right? If there's something in the environment, but it breaks down really easily, then you don't have to worry about it as much, but there are some things that don't break down at all, right? And they, and they, they will linger in your body or the environment for, well, not your body, but for thousands of years. So, um, so that's, that's, that's this, and then this idea of bioaccumulation, I'll show you that on the next slide. I think it's the next slide, uh, what bioaccumulation means. But basically, contaminants are going to get, uh, you're going to get higher and higher amounts of contaminants the higher you are up on a food chain. So if you think about it, well, actually, let me see if the slide will show it. Yeah, I'll show it when we get here. So you see little things, medium-sized things, big things. So I'll, I'll explain the idea of bioaccumulation on the next slide. Um, examples of contamination, so you have mercury, like methylmercury. There are different types of mercury, mercury, and methylmercury is the toxic one. There's ethylmercury and stuff, but methylmercury, here's an, here was an example of 1953, super high levels in Minamata, Japan, but mercury is in basically all seafood. The question is how to, how to minimize the amount you're exposed to. Uh, PCBs and PBBs, 
Uh, these are like flame retardants and things like that. So they've been found, they're everywhere. Um, they're in your body, I can guarantee that. Um, Michigan, 1973, Taiwan, 1979. Um, interactive effects of mercury and PCBs. So they both damage brain function. I've mentioned this, this is probably the third video now. And if you're in my class, I'll share the video. But I go to YouTube and type in little things matter. There's a video I just love. I'm mean, gonna hate it, but I love it, um, how well they did uh, from an organization in Canada that talks about um, PCBs and mercury are, and lead are all talked about there. And now each of them, as they accumulate in our body, um, they impact IQ, they impact learning, development, et cetera. So, and they do have, I guess you'd say, like it says interactive, but more of like a synergistic effect. So if you're exposed to lead, uh, you'll see, oh, you look at a population of people that are all exposed to lead, you'll see the IQ drop some. If they're exposed to PCBs on top of that, IQ drops further. If they're exposed to mercury, IQ drops further, right? This, so they, they it's not like um, um, they all have the, the same effect. So getting, getting exposed to three of them is no worse than getting exposed to one. They have an additive effect on top of each other. And then if you, of course, if you're malnourished on top of that, it makes it even worse. All right, um, so this idea of bioaccumulation, I like to call it biological magnification. So you'll see here that the higher up on a food chain an organism is, um, the more uh, toxic chemicals it's being exposed to. So you've got here, um, so, let's, so we'll just read them and go through it. Plants and plankton at the bottom of the food chain become contaminated with toxic chemicals like mercury, which is, which is these little red dots. But each individual organism doesn't have a lot of mercury in them. But then you have the, the small fish that eat these little, little, so you have several tons of producer organisms like plant and animal plankton. But then you have small fish that are gonna eat those. And notice that they're, that they're gonna eat hundreds or thousands and thousands of these. So they're gonna acquire all those toxins that they consumed. So basically each level up, you've got the toxins that you eat plus the toxins that they ate and the toxins that they ate, et cetera. That's the idea of biological magnification or bioaccumulation. So here at level two, contaminants become more concentrated in small fish that eat, that eat the plants and plankton because they're all being exposed to it from the water. It's where it's coming from. So everyone in this system is being exposed to the water, but they're also, the higher you go, the more they're being exposed to, the, to it from the food they ate. So at level two, a few tons of plankton eating fish, fish such as bluegill, perch, steam, stream trout, and smelt. Then you go to number three, contaminants become further concentrated in larger fish that eat the small fish from the lower part of the food chain. So level three, you have 100 pounds of fish eating fish, such as lake trout, walleye, and bass. Then number four, if none of the chemicals are lost along the way, which something like uh, mercury or PCBs, are, they, they won't break down, um, people ultimately receive all of the toxic chemicals that were present in the original plants and plankton. So you get the toxins you ate plus the toxins they ate, that they ate, that they ate. And that's, how, that's why you get this accumulation at the top. Um, so for example, and you'll see this more in later slides, if you're gonna eat like a little anchovy, right? It's a small fish, hasn't lived very long. Uh, an anchovy is not gonna have a lot of mercury in it. But if you ate something like a swordfish or a shark, they're gonna have eaten, eaten large fish that ate medium-sized fish, that ate small fish, that ate those anchovies, right? So they're gonna be much higher levels of, of these types of toxins. So I'd recommend eating a lot more sardines than I would shark, for example. All right. Um, okay, give me just a second here. Okay, sorry about that. So now we're talking about arsenic, which is another contaminant that can be found. So we mentioned mercury and PCBs and how they how they move through the aquatic ecosystems, especially. Um, arsenic is a naturally occurring in the water, air, and soil, so it can be everywhere. Arsenic-based pesticides were commonly used in the United States until 1970. So this is something that arsenic-based compounds have been around forever. Um, that one of the first antimicrobial drugs ever ever produced was called Salversam, which was an arsenic-based compound. It's been used, like you see here, as pesticides. So um, organic foods may still contain arsenic just because it's everywhere. Um, apple juice and rice are routinely tested because they're the ones that have been found to be have the highest levels. I think your polished rice especially. Uh, the FDA is confident that low levels are safe, and the FDA will take action if there's 10 parts per billion or greater is found. So. The reality is you are gonna be exposed to some of these things. I mean, even if you're eating a super, super healthy diet. Consumer guidelines. FDA regulates uh, the presence of contaminants in food. So, you, you know, part of it is you have to trust that the food that's reached your, your fork um, has been properly tested and has minimal contamination, not none. Uh, mercury poisoning, so from fish and other seafood, uh, fish recommendations, other toxins found in fish. So 
Fish are absolutely worth eating, just so you know. Um, you, what, when, you're eat, when you're consuming so fish, so my general recommendations are um, you eat the smaller ones. Like I said, I don't, I've never had um, swordfish or shark and never plan on it. Um, I, w I, I like um, farm ray, or sorry, uh, wild caught salmon, for example. So like a wild caught sockeye, sockeye salmon would be a really good example of a fish that um, has a lower, lower mercury level uh, and, you know, so they're uh, really, really I mean, healthy fats, etc. So I like wild caught over farm raised just because farm raised fish usually are exposed to more contaminants in the area and from their food. So they're gonna, there's gonna be a larger um, bioaccumulation there. So I do generally recommend um, wild caught over farmed ra fresh when, or farm raised when possible. Um, smaller fish, so I, like a, to me a sardine would be the perfect thing to eat. So a, 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 a tin of sardines has 800 milligrams of the healthy omega-3 fats, your fish oils, uh, small fish, short life, etc. So just, uh, uh, you know, if, if you do consume a lot of fish, I would look, I would look at the different websites and try to find ways to, Environmental Working Group has a section um, where you can look into that and make sure you're consuming the, the smartest fish possible. Now, um, so if you consume fish on a regular basis, you are going to have more PCBs in your diet, for example, and you're going to have more mercury in your diet. So you could you could look at that as a strike against it. But but um, people that consume fish, basically, you will have a slightly, slightly, slightly increased risk of, of let's say, cancer because you're being exposed to these PCBs. But you will have a, a, a very significant decreased risk in heart disease because of the healthy fats, et cetera. So um, I've, never, I've never seen a study that has recommended that you don't consume fish on a regular basis because there, there is a little bit of a con, but the pros far outweigh it. So I can see there are potential harm versus benefits from nutrients. So I, would, I, I err on the side of saying that, yes, you should be smart about the fish you consume. And, and consume um, the fish that has the most nutrients with the least mercury and PCBs, for example. So like a wild caught sockeye salmon being a good one or a wild caught sardine. Uh, so I, so so eat the right fish in the right amounts and to me, the, the benefits outweigh the risks for sure. All right, discussion question one. Discuss mercury levels in seafood and why it's important to minimize your consumption of mercury. So that, I mean, mercury is extremely neurotoxic. Uh, mercury damages the developing brain. Pregnant women, lactating women, and children are the most vulnerable to mercury toxicity. So th there would be times when you'd want to be smarter about your consumption. Let's say like, so tuna, you know, the government recommends, uh, you know, puts limits on how much tuna maybe that you should consume. And if you're pregnant, that number goes down. And if you're a baby or you're a kid, that number goes down. Goes, goes down. So at-risk populations, but they never recommend none. It's just they, they, they decrease the, the safe allowable amount. Small, younger fish tend to have lower mercury levels like the anchovies or sardines I mentioned. Large fish have the highest concentration of mercury due to bioaccumulation. Tilefish, swordfish, king mackerel, and shark tend to have the highest mercury levels. So I mentioned some of those. Natural toxins found in food. Uh, any substance can be toxic when consumed in excess, including water, right? Water can kill you. Uh, chemical structure and quantity consumed of different types of natural toxins. Uh, we'll talk about, so goitrogens, they, um, because of their impact on, on iodine absorption, et cetera, goitrogens um, can have an impact on the thyroid gland. So, I mean, now there's lots and lots of really healthy foods that, ha that have goitrogens in them, like, like broccoli and stuff. So I wouldn't recommend uh, not consuming them, but I wouldn't recommend, like there was a case report of a lady who developed, uh, uh, who basically died, but she developed a severe thyroid problem because she was consuming five pounds of raw cabbage a day. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't overdo it. And if I had hypothyroidism, I would um, be even smarter about looking for foods that have goitrogens and, and minimizing them. But um, again, I think the benefits generally tend to outweigh the risks as long as you're consuming an appropriate amount. Cyanogens, we'll cover them coming up. And then solanine I mentioned earlier, that's the reason that you can't eat raw potatoes. But but again, last I checked, you'd have to eat 20 pounds of raw potatoes to get to reach a toxic level, but still um, follow those kind of recommendations. All right, uh, let's look at where we would find these. So match these, pause for a second if you need to. So lima beans and fruit seeds like the apricot pit have cyanogens in them. We'll go through them by type. And then you notice the other one that says cyanogens. Um, late trial seed, uh, falsely reported as a cancer cure, also cyanogens, I've, se I've seen that before. Um, goitrogens, cabbage, bok choy, turnips, mustard greens, kale, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, and broccoli. So those are all, all goitrogens, but I'd recommend you eat all of them. They're, they're nutrient den dense, they're cruciferous, most of them. Like, yeah, absolutely, those are good for you, but not massive amounts if you have underlying thyroid problems. Bottom one, 
Cooking deactivates enzymes that inhibit iodine uptake. uptake. That's the glycogens. That's why I recommend cooking them, right? So I said five pounds of raw cabbage a day is what caused that serious problem in that woman. I believe she was in Russia. So if, if you're concerned about glycogens, you should definitely be cooking these things rather than eating them raw. I would say almost everyone on the list I would cook before I ate it. Uh, probably not kale. But um, uh, so if you're worried about it, then you cook those foods. And then solanine is a narcotic-like substance found in potato sprouts and green color under the skin. So this, but, but again, you should cook your potatoes. All right, uh, pesticides. You know, my wife works in oncology, and we and we we are nervous about this, right? There, uh, there, you know, there's a, a beyondcancer.org, I believe, is a website that we we, we go to that links to um, different studies that that link pesticide exposure to uh, to different types of cancer. So uh, she's involved in a group that's the, a kind of a task force that's been looking into that because you do seem to see certain types of cancer seem to be more common in farming communities like the area that we, we live. So uh, uh, I don't I don't uh, I don't know what to do about it. You know, you, again, you can try to limit your pesticide exposure by maybe not using things on your own lawn and um, buying organic. But um, we just live in a world coated with it. Like our, you know, we have an organic garden in our backyard, but on the other side of the fence there is a field, right? And it's little, literally a field, right? So it's probably soybeans this year. You, soybeans and corn, I'm sure we're exposed to quite a bit from from that. Uh, I don't know what to do about it. All right, um, ensure, ensure, pe pesticides ensure crop survival but leave residues in the environment. So the, the upside of pesticides is they control the populations of, of organisms that are going to destroy our crops. So they uh, improve yields, keep people from starving to death, and you know keep food costs down. So there's a lot, a lot of value there. Um, hazards of pesticides. I, I like this point of a vulnerable population. So um, if you are if you have other underlying health problems, just like seemingly everything else, if you have underlying health problems, then I think the exposure risk is is harder on you than than a normal. I don't want to say normal, a typical person that can maybe detoxify pesticides better than you can. So if you're going to be exposed to these things, the key is to be healthy and have the nutrients and everything you need to properly detoxify and deal with them. Um, which means you know not carrying around too much fat, et cetera, et cetera. Regulation of pesticides, both the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency and the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, they both have tolerance regulations, just understanding that pesticides are with us, uh, but you have to make sure you stay under these threshold limits. Uh, pesticides from other countries, they're obviously different, different groups are overseeing that, uh, the FAO and the World Health Organization. All right. Um, Monitoring pesticides, the FDA collects and analyzes domestic and imported foods, seizes or destroys samples that are in violation, which is which is a good thing. Uh, individual state regulations can differ. Obviously, like California, for example, has more stringent regulations than, than here in South Dakota. Uh, food in the field, food on the plate, these things are all, all being assessed and monitored. Uh, the market basket survey, this is just, again, monitoring these kind of pesticides. And if you want to minimize your exposure, then then go organic, especially with that, with the, um, what I what we, we talked about earlier from the Environmental Working Group, their, um, um, their well, I forgot the word, the dirty dozen. Sorry, I was going to say daily dozen. I think that's from a TV show or something. The dirty dozen, where you can remove 80% of your pesticide exposure from your food by buying those 12 foods organic. Consumer concerns. FDA is a monitoring agency that sets standards, checks to adequately assess food safety, and acts promptly when problems arise. Uh, minimizing risks, uh, factors for ingesting pesticides. So we'll look at, um, uh, again, buying organic, um, rinsing foods, these types of things. You know, you can min uh, peeling things. These are all ways to minimize your exposure. Pesticide alternatives, crop rotation. Organisms that destroy pests, like they're looking at, you know, like the BT, uh, that's, that stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, but the BT corn, BT cotton, etc. Uh, planting of non-food crops that would, that would also function as pesticides. So there are pros and cons to all these things. Pesticides work really well, um, but if you can do these other things and you can remove the burden of pests um, without the chemicals, then I'm all for that. All right, minimizing risks. When shopping for foods, uh, select fruits and vegetables that do not have holes. Select a variety of foods to minimize exposure to any one pesticide. Consider buying certified organic foods when shopping for produce most likely to be contaminated. That's the dirty dozen I mentioned earlier. Discussion question two. Describe how organically grown crops are different compared to other crops. What's the difference in nutrition between the two? And what do the code stickers on produce mean? So you can think about that for a moment before you move on. Organic crops are grown and processed according to the USDA regulations. Meat, poultry, eggs, and dairy must meet the definition of grazing conditions, feed, hormones, and antibiotics. 
So a lot of times, like we buy food from a chemical free farm. Um, they're not certified organic though, right? They haven't done the paperwork. They said there was, you know, 400 pages of paperwork and expensive and all that. So some things are going to be chemical free, even though they're not certified organic, but to be certified organic, you have to meet these, you have to meet these recommendations. Um, like for a food to say it's organic, I believe that it like has to be 95% organic. And if a food is like 70% organic, then you can talk about, it can talk about, I think three ingredients on the front that are organic. So there are different rules and regulations there. But um, yeah, so to to be organic, you've got you you can't radiate it. You can't use antibiotics in most situations. Um, the you, no bovine recombinant, you know, growth hormone, etc. Uh, nutritional differences between conventional and organic foods are small. Uh, you know, I would I would generally say that organics are going to err on being slightly more nutrient dense. But I mentioned earlier that's not the main reason because uh, to to choose organic. It might be the main reason to garden where you can control your own soil and make things as nutritious as possible. But uh, uh, the main thing with organic would be the, you know, it hasn't been radiated and um, pesticide free, et cetera. Uh, pesticide residue on conventionally grown foods is higher than in organic foods. Organic foods can't, they can't spray pesticides on them, but they still get exposed from neighboring farms, et cetera. The most contaminated foods pose negligible health risks to consumers. So it's up to you where you, where, where you do with that information. Codes on produce stickers that are organic have five digits. Genetically modified codes start with the number eight and also have five digits. Conventional produce has four. So you can read the code on a little sticker on your banana and you can tell if it's um, conventional or organic and you can also tell if it's been genetically modified. Food additives. So this is obviously lots of things here. We're just gonna just talk about the, the topic at broad. Uh, regulations governing food additives. So the benefits are food safety, enhanced nutrient quality, preservatives, so to prevent spoilage. Um, additive additives may be intentional or indirect. FDA regulation, they have to be effective at their job, detectable and measurable in the final food product if they are or not, and if they're safe. So the GRASS list, GRASS stands for generally recognized as safe. Some items are exempt from FDA approval. Generally, rec so like, uh, generally recognized as safe. So things like, um, even like uh, genetically modified foods, like genetically modified corn, they say is so similar to regular corn that they just they it, it earned grass status. It's generally recognized as safe. So some examples are salt, sugar, caffeine, and some spices. And that that list is constantly going to be evolving and changing. The Delaney clause basically says that if 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 an ingredient in a food has been shown to cause cancer, then it, then you know we have to deal with that. So it's called the Delaney clause. Addresses carcinogens or cancer-causing uh, substances in foods and drugs. Um, intense debates over the limitations. Again, where you know where do we draw the line? We have to draw the line somewhere. Our food can't be sterile. Our food can't be completely risk-free. Uh, you know, basically like a, a one in a million cancer risk is has to be considered safe. And that's basically where, where, where they stand, right? Um, negligible risk standard used instead of zero risk policy. That's what I mean when I say like a one in a million. So like a one in a million risk is generally considered acceptable. Uh, but I guess a two in a million risk would not be. All right, the margin of safety. I think I have a little chart coming up here, but um, um, risks must be determined by the research. Allowance in food 100 times below unsafe levels. So if you have a food additive or a compound and you know it's dangerous here at this level, you, you, you're, you, you remove, you, you, there's a, a safety factor, kind of a fudge factor there. So if the, food, if, the, if the level in a food is 100 times below what we know to be the unsafe level, then that's going to be considered safe. That's that margin of safety. Um, FDA regulations against additive use that disguises faulty products. Uh, like it used to be, you know, they would add, you could add colors and stuff to like milk. Some, some, at one point, milk was so gross, they were like adding chalk and things to it just to make it look like milk. Um, there was a time in the past where margarine had to be colored like pink or different colors because um, people were being confused by it and they were being um, sold margarine and that was being called butter, you know, things like that. So you can't deceive the customer. Um, you can't use it to disguise uh, faulty products. It can't significantly destroy nutrients. So these additives should preserve nutrients, not destroy them. And then if there is an economical sound process alternative, then, then you have to use that instead. So it's basically when we have to use an additive, it's okay as long as it's not disguising a faulty product, deceiving the customer, destroying nutrients, and there's, and there's no other alternative. All right, so what are some intentional food additives? First of all, the ways in which food goes bad, it loses its flavor and attractiveness. So, so compounds that um, keep, keep a food's flavor, keep its color, etc. these are going to be used. 
Uh, here's some, ex some examples are antimicrobial agents. So if food is contaminated with microbes, then there's risk there. So these compounds um, decrease that risk. Salt and sugar. So they did that. So salt, when you, you know, salted fish and adding, adding salt and sugar to canned goods, salt and sugar create a hypertonic environment and it pulls the liquid out of pathogens or out of bacteria, microbes, sorry. So like you have a bacteria, it's in that can of peas, it's still there, but you pull the liquid out of it, it's called plasma lysis, and it shuts off its metabolism. So it preserve, so it doesn't kill that bacteria, but it, can't, it, it won't be growing and reproducing while it's in that can. So salt and sugar are great examples. So you, so you like I said, add salt to your peas, add sugar to your fruit, uh, et cetera. Nitrites. Nitrites are used uh, primarily, you think like nitrites, um, you think of bacon and, and cured meats because those cured meats can have um, Clostridium botulinum spores in them. And the nitrites, what their job is to do is to keep those spores from germinating. It also helps with the color. So it's, um, so the pros of nitrites is reduced risk of botulism and food looks better. Uh, the cons are just the nitrites. So, so this is one of the reasons that cured meats um, are, are put in a different category than other meats when it comes to ri uh, disease risk, especially cancer risk, because um, these, uh, these nitrites can become these nitrogen-based, like reactive nitrogen species, like called nitrosamines that are in your gut. So, cure, you know, I would never argue that, um, that cured meats are as good for you as other kinds of meats, not at all. And part of it is because of these. And you can see you've got you can go to the store and you get your nitrate free break-ins or those kind of things. Um, they usually have celery salt or different things added to them that have a ton of these nitrites to begin with. So I'm not sure if that's making a big difference. So yeah, I would not base your diet around cured meats that need these, but that's why they're there. Then bacteriophages, I love these. So phages or bacteriophages, the word bacteriophage means bacteria eater. These are viruses that infect and destroy bacteria. So we are now um, using viruses that hunt down bacteria in our food. So I think I think this is gonna become more and more common, not only in, in our food, but also treating human disease. Uh, I think in 2017 was the first time in a generation where there was actually a phage therapy center in the U.S. So I'm ex really excited about that. We talk about these a lot in microbiology. So they you know, imagine you get sick with a drug resistant infection, a bacterial infection, and the doctor says, okay, you have an infection. Our treatment plan is going to be in to infect you with the virus, but the virus doesn't care about you. The virus will hunt down and kill that bacteria. That's what bacteriophages do. It's called phage therapy. But in food, uh, the first time I saw this being used was bacteriophages were being used in deli meats because um, deli meats can have listeria, an organism that can can lead to death even. Uh, for most people, it's completely manageable. But if you are like, this is why pregnant women are supposed to avoid deli meats because of listeria contamination. So they're using um, bacteriophages for listeria and then I believe E. coli as well. So you've got, um, so maybe there was some fecal contamination in your food, but the phages were destroying the E. coli before you get sick. So E. coli and listeria are the two first places I've seen uh, bacteriophages being used. All right, antioxidants and other food additives designed to, you know, for flavor, color, etc. Um, exposure, so long list here, just again, we're just going to briefly go through these, but exposure to oxygen. So um, vitamin C and E are, are going to be, and then sulfites and BHA and BHT, these are going to function as antioxidants or they're going to preserve color, or preserve flavor with foods that are exposed to oxygen. Oxygen oxidizes things, right? Cut, cut an apple open and watch it turn brown. That's what oxygen does to food. Um, look at the meat. I used to work in a meat counter. Uh, the, you know, the, the, meat, the meat gets darker when it sits out in the air. So oxygen can, can quote unquote damage damage our food. These are all things that minimize that. Um, colors, so you have a lot of plant-derived ones like, uh, uh, what's a big one? Um, I mean, some come from, you can, there's some from beetle shells and plants and seaweeds and algaes, all sorts of cool ones, but uh, I was just tipping my tongue, I'm getting old. But, um, but they're, they're plant-derived colors, artificial colors, uh, minimal remain on the approved list just because they, they, they found the ones that are safe and we kind of stick with those. But um, Ah, it's going to drive me nuts, but I can't remember it. But there's a, it's a seaweed extract. It was in a food I ate just a couple weeks ago. Cannot remember, sorry. But there are artificial colors can be used and plant-derived ones as well. Some artificial colors and, and flavors and stuff have been linked to things like hyperactivity. So if you, if you or someone you love struggles with that, you may want to consider avoiding a lot of these artificial colors and flavors. Nutrients can be added to food all the time. You know, that's this idea of enriched versus fortified. When you add a nutrient back to a food that was lost during process, processing, it's been enriched. When you add a nutrient that was never there, it's been fortified, right? So our salt is fortified with iodine. Um, our grain products are fortified with folate because you put them there in levels that didn't exist before. 
Flavors, you have monosodium glutamate or MSG. So some people appear to be sensitive to this, but um, others don't. I don't. I think it's probably been a little overblown. Uh, but um, but if you're sensitive to it, then I would avoid it. There's plenty of MSG food, free foods out there. Same thing with the sugar alternatives. So aspartame, saccharin, uh, and it says acceptable daily intake. So these have been well studied. Do I think they're the best thing on the planet? No. Um, I believe that... Um, the, the studies that show that they can become toxic, you, because of that, that safety factor we talked about earlier, you would need to be consuming 250 cans of these a day. Now, drinking a six pack every day for 20 years, could that have some risk? It, it could, I don't know. But, um, but they're generally, the safety profile is, is it's acceptable. And to me, it's, it's, it's all about the fact that it's a sugar alternative. So that you have to, if someone asks me, is Diet Coke safe? I would say a couple things. Number one, like, should you drink, you should drink water. But, but, but if you're going to drink a Coke or a Diet Coke, what you're basically asking me is, let's say you have a 20-ounce bottle, bottle of each, is a tiny bit of NutraSweet dangerous, more dangerous than 65 grams of sugar? And I would say no, right? So I think that if you're, and studies show this, studies show that getting people to drink from drinking regular soda to diet soda helps them lose weight, helps them control their, and maintain their weight loss. Like um, some studies show that getting people to drink diet soda helps them lose weight and, and adhere to their weight loss program better than getting them to drink water. So I'm, I'm not saying it's safer for you than water, but I think the, the research over the last few years has shown that these can absolutely absolutely be part of a, a diet, especially if you need to cut your calories. It's a phenomenal place to do so. You can just, if you can whack out tens of grams of sugar and hundreds of grams of calories a day by making this switch, then it's probably worth it. Now, once you've lost the weight and if you want to take your health a step further, if you would switch to from this to, to drinking tea or water or something, I would, I would absolutely support that. But I would say that um, I, I don't like seeing these demonized. There are lots of weight loss gurus and fitness people that demonize these. I would say anything that helps you um, lose weight because having extra body fat, we know is dangerous. Having aspartame, maybe is dangerous. I know personally, I, I attribute um, diet sodas to being really helping me with my adherence to my diet. My diet is more sustainable when I have them than when I don't. Because if I'm craving something sweet, I'll have a sugar-free gum, which has uh, some of these things in it, right? Or I'll have a diet soda. I like uh, Mr. Pib Zero is my favorite, but um, I'll have that, and it'll take the edge off. And so it kept me from from falling off on my diet. So I'm 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 a, I'm becoming more and more supportive of these because of what they do and because of what the alternatives are. But I would I would always recommend you drink water. All right. So then there's also additives that, that improve texture and stability. These would be things like uh, lecithin or emulsifiers, right? They keep foods from getting um, too wet, uh, which can cause spoilage, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of things go in our food. All right, um, discuss reasons why nutrient additives are used in foods and give examples of additives and what they do to the food. Which types of additives are commonly found in greens? Okay, correcting deficiencies and restoring nutrient levels after processing are two reasons for nutrient additives. Those would be, again, restoring nutrient levels after processing. That would be an enriched food. Um, correcting deficiencies would be a fortified food where you, add, where you add food just to make sure that the person eating it gets it in their diet. Emulsifiers, I just mentioned these, help stabilize, stabilize mayonnaise or control crystallization in syrups. Gums thicken foods and help form gels like um, auger is one that's used as a thickening agent. We use it in the microbiology lab, but it's also in your ice creams and stuff too. Yeast provides leavening, bicarbonates and acids control acidity, so all good ones. Emulsifiers though, because they, uh, the, they have an effect on lipids, they do impact the gut in a way that um, has been shown to disrupt the microbiome. I'm not saying I avoid them, but um, your microbiome and gut health would probably be better without emulsifiers than with them. All right, nutrients can act as antioxidants like vitamin Z and C or be used for color like beta carotene. So we talked about how we have to stabilize foods that are exposed to oxygen using antioxidants. Manufacturers sometimes add nutrients to fortify foods. The five nutrients added to grains are thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, folate, those are all B vitamins, and iron, which is not a B vitamin, it's a mineral. Okay. Indirect food additives. So here we have acrylamide. This is going to be formed during cooking. So acrylamide, maybe you've heard of this one, forms during high temperature cooking of carbohydrate rich foods containing sugar and the amino acid asparagine. Uh, probable carcinogen. Quantities in foods are low, but you see where you get them. Uh, so fried, fried carbs uh, or high temperature carbs that also have some protein in them. So french fries, potato chips, cereals, and cookies have acrylamide. Food packaging. 
Paper, plastic coatings, and sealants. I mentioned earlier that the plastic coating inside of a, a can, like a, canned, um, a can of soup or Chef Boyardee or something, usually has BPA. Unless you specifically see that they, they advertise a BPA-free lining, you have to expect that it's BPA. So you might be avoiding plastic bottles because of, because of BPA, but you forget that, that they're, you're going to find it inside your canned goods as well. Same thing with like a can, right? You switch from a, a plastic bottle of soda to a can of soda. I believe that the can of soda would have the BPA lining as well. Um, so a active packaging helps cook the food. Uh, the packaging components migrate into the food. So you think about like, you know, if you're, um, if you have a saran wrap over a food that's being cooked, it's touching the food, there will be some leaching there. Um, passive packaging simply holds the food as it cooks. Materials still migrate at high temperatures. Use only plastic wraps labeled as microwave safe. So you, you know, make sure if you're going to be heating things up. I generally don't recommend heating plastic because um, um, there, are there are compounds that are in plastic that leach into your food. So if you take like a bottle of water and you leave it in your car for a week and then drink it, there will be more phthalates and BPAs and those kind of things in it. So um, I generally recommend, we use glass, I, we use glass containers that have plastic lids, but we don't put the plastic lids in the microwave. So I recommend heating up glass, uh, glass and wood, and those kind of things over plastic. So we use plastic for storage in the refrigerator, but if we're gonna heat things up, they, they move into a glass container or onto a plate. Just, just, you know, one of those things, I don't know how big of a deal it is, but 20 years from now, if we find out that it's a big deal, then hey, I saved my life, I saved my son 20 years of being exposed to these chemicals. If we're wrong, oh, I spent a few extra seconds moving foods out of plastic containers before I heated it up. It's, you know, it's called the precautionary principle. I err on the side of caution, especially when we're talking about the health of my children. So I might, you know, the downside is I might spend a little bit more time and money on these types of things. The upside is, I may, I may minimize their exposure to something that we find out was a bigger deal than we thought. All right, I've mentioned BPA before, and then just obviously recycling codes that just tell you, they tell you what, like if you look at a plastic um, container, you got the little triangle arrows, and the number inside of it tells you what kind of compounds are in it. Okay, decaffeinated coffee, hormones, and antibiotics. They're just throwing a lot of things together here. Deca uh, so there is, you use a compound called methylene chloride to decaffeinate coffee. So some people don't agree with that and don't, rec don't recommend decaffeinated coffee for that reason. So again, benefits, risks. I don't know if there's any risk, but if you want to consume coffee but need to minimize caffeine consumption, then maybe the benefit outweighs the risk. I just don't think decaffeinated coffee tastes good. Okay. Hormones, um, incidental additive use is intentional sometimes. What remains in the product is not intentional. So this would be uh, an example there would be BGH, which is bicombinant, bec uh, bovine growth hormone, sorry. So uh, bovine growth hormone was given to cows to increase their size, increase milk production, et cetera. But then some of that was getting into the, into the food products. So uh, it needs to be within the range of what naturally occurs in products. Now, I don't know if it's bad, but um, because of how it looks and because consumers do have some power, you will see that dairy products um, say free of recombinant bovine growth hormone. And the, honestly, I think that my personal opinion is because Walmart stopped selling it. I think Walmart has more power than the federal government uh, sometimes when it comes to foods. Um, the, government, the federal government did not say that bovine growth hormone was bad. Walmart said, we won't sell dairy products that have recomb recombinant bovine growth hormone, and voila, the world changed. So that's just evidence that you have more power than you think because you vote with your wallet. You make companies like Walmart and McDonald's think about these things, and they're such a huge part of the food system that they have power, right? So it's interesting. Don't think, you know, that that, that is really where, where your power comes from in these kind of issues. You vote with your wallet. Antibiotics, um, again, incidental additive use is intentional or remains in the product is not intentional. So again, giving antibiotics to an animal, um, causing that to remain in, its, remain in the food supply um, can cause resistance. You know, this is something we cover way more in microbiology, but it doesn't matter where resistance occurs, right? So like, for example, there's a type of organism that is colistin resistant. Colistin is a very important antibiotic. The resistance developed on pig farms in China, and now it's in humans in the United States. It doesn't matter. There's no such thing as a, a regional issue when it comes to microbes, right? Evolution doesn't care where it happened. So um, antibiotics in our food supply are a big deal. We talk about it a lot in this class, separate from this video. But um, antibiotics in the food supply matter because antibiotic resistance develops anywhere that it becomes a problem everywhere. All right. Um, FDA requirements for metabolism and excretion just to make sure you're not consuming a bunch of antibiotics, but the resistance can occur even if you're not exposed to the antibiotics. So this is something that we have to be smarter about, in my opinion. All right, consumer concerns about water.
excuse me, sources of drinking water. We have surface water is readily contaminated, but the contamination is reversible because of cleansing methods like how we disinfect in our water or we treat our water. Groundwater, there's slower rates of contamination, but it's more permanent. If a well's been contaminated, basically you have to dig a deeper well, dig a new, a new well, etc. Water systems and regulations. So we have public water systems like your municipalities. Uh, they disinfect, usually using chlorine to kill bacteria, and the Environmental Protection, Regula Regulation, uh, Environmental Protection Agency regulates it. So real quickly, water treatment involves levels of filtration and then, and then um, some sort of disinfection. So generally you have these settling tanks where large things are set, settled out of the water. So it's almost like a filter, but only large things get removed. Then you have what's called a, a flocculant, this chemical that's added, that takes medium-sized things and causes them to clump together, which makes them large, so they now settle out. So now you've gotten rid of large things and medium-sized things. Then you use filters, which are layers of usually like uh, rocks and sand and ch ch coal, charcoal, not coal, charcoal and stuff. So you have these filters, and then that filters out the small things. So like your, your large, your small, or medium, and your small particulates have been removed now, most of them. Then the little bit is left behind, uh, going to be the virus and some bacteria. They're disinfected using usually chlorine, but you can, um, they can use ozone. Ozone is being used in more than 5% of municipalities now in the United States, so usually both. Chlorine, uh, ozone, if you've used all the chlorine you can, but the water still isn't clean enough, you can use chloramines, which is a combination of chlorine and, and ammonia. Usually, if you live in a place that does that, they send you letters and they warn you not to use your um, water for fish tanks. So you do all that, then your water should be clean. And then you check your municipality constantly is checking your water and look and look at the safety reports that they send you. Um, water characteristics: you have hard versus soft water. So you have, if you have a water softener, you use that soft. To, uh, they use that salt to soften the water. It's just um, you use less soap. It's better on your clothes, better on your skin. So there, that's the, I like soft water. I prefer it anyways. Home water treatments, you can do all sorts of different things here. You have activated carbon filters, so you, so you can filter your water. Um, ozonation, I mentioned how ozone kills microbes. Reverse osmosis, that's what we have. We have a reverse osmosis system that usually is, uh, like, it's like Culligan, um, and that removes basically everything from water. And then you can also distill your water. I used to have one of those when I was a single man and living in Cherokee. So there's lots of ways for you to treat your water. Uh, there are, you can put like chlorine filters on your, uh, um, like on your shower heads to remove the chlorine from your water before you bathe with it if you want. There's lots of things you can do. Those are just some examples of keeping your water safe. Uh, so that's how you can control the water coming into your house. But, I, but the average American consumes about 35 gallons of bottled water a, a year, a day, I was going to say a day, a year. So you got to know, you got to know about this as well. Um, so FDA regulations say that bottled water is neither safer nor healthier than tap water. So some bottled water has been, you know, undergone reverse osmosis. In some places, it's just taken out of the same bodies of water that you're, that the area water would be. Um, some blind taste studies of taste uh, test studies have shown that people can't tell the difference really. We uh, bottled water generally it's cold. People like that. They uh, they perceive it as better, but it doesn't have to be. And then if you have, with bottled water, you got the issue of the plastic container it was in too. So if you're worried about that. Water quality varies, so you know, look into the water that you're drinking, making sure it's safe, make sure the containers it's in is safe, choose, the, choose your brands wisely, and, and know the source of your water as well. All right, that's why your label requirements must identify the source, and then how it's handled. This is something I think about a lot, like with the, um, I, was, I was at a gas station one time, and this van pulls up, you know, and gets all these big containers of water out, super, super hot, right? So like I, I'm, I'm a big fan of not heating up plastic, like I mentioned before. So if I, if I bought a case of bottled water, I would want it to be cool when I bought it. I would bring it home and keep it cool. I wouldn't keep it in the garage, right? These kind of things. But I think about that, right? It was cool at some point, but then it's stared, stored in some hot warehouse and carried in some hot van. And, it's, and then when you buy it, it might be cool. But you have to understand how it's been handled the whole time because that even if you keep your bottled water cold, doesn't mean that it hasn't already been in a hot environment that caused some of the leaching of these chemicals. So something for you to consider and look into if it, if it matters to you personally. Okay, our last discussion question. Water has been in the news a lot lately, from lead in the water to potentially harmful effects of bottled water. Do you prefer tap or bottled water? Can you taste the difference in water in one area, such as campus, from another, such as your home or water from a well? So before, we, you know, we'll, we'll see what they have to say here. But, um, so the thing about the harmful effects of bottled water, what they're talking about there, uh, again, it could be the plastics and stuff. But if you have like reverse osmosis water, one of the things you have to be concerned about is that fluoride's been removed. So they fluoridate our water on purpose, but reverse osmosis removes it. So, um, and that, that's what we do. And that, that's fine because I've I mentioned in several videos that fluoride's uh, primary function is topical. 
So since we don't have fluoridated water, since our kids don't drink fluoridated water, and we don't either, we all use fluoride rinses and fluoridated dental products. So our, we always use toothpaste with fluoride and we use rinses that have fluoride. So that's how we counteract that. But are, if you're worried about the plastic bottles and stuff, you, know, you have to find glass bottles, I guess. Um, can you tell the difference? Now, it depends on where you lived, but um, yeah, I, I, you know, my grandparents lived in, in a farm that had well water. It tasted a lot different than the city water does. So I, I can tell the difference in different places, but some people have kind of always had the same kind of water, but well water, I always joke that well water tastes really good. You just got to chew it a little bit. All right. Students often have a strong preference for tap or bottled water. You know, I, I drink Culligan all the time. I, I don't remember last time. Well, I have a bottle of water if I need to, but Culligan is basically the same. Uh, many recognize the environmental impact of bottled water, and some may recognize the differences in the taste of water depending on the source. So environmental impact, you're primarily dealing with the bottle. Okay, we did it. Now the lesson is over. You should have learned to describe how foodborne illnesses can be prevented. I gave you a long list there that should keep you safe. Explain how to minimize nutrient losses in the kitchen. Explain how environmental contaminants get into foods and how people can protect themselves against contamination. Check. Identify natural toxicants and determine whether they are hazardous. Debate the risk and benefits of using pesticides. List common food additives, their purposes and examples. And discuss consumer concerns about water. So we did it. All right, one chapter to go. Um, keep working hard and uh, have a wonderful day. Be blessed.